Well, I was sitting there wondering, what if they sing Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer? <laughs> and I'm going through my mind thinking about scripture verses and how do you transition that, but wow, my, my, my. Oh, holy not, amen? Boy, it's so good to hear you all again. I love you guys. Good to see some Alabamians here in Texas. So it's always a joy when I heard you guys were going to be here again. I thought, man, it's going to be a great night. So thank you. God bless you. We love you all. Thank you for the worship tonight. Incredible, man, this orchestra and choir, Brother Fred, man. God bless you guys. What incredible. Uh, you know, uh, I was uh, had the opportunity just to kind of live stream with you in the sessions. And, man, this has been an amazing 30. This is the 31st year. 31st year Bible conference. Uh, last night, uh, Brother Steve, Brother Mac, uh, wow. And in this morning, I so appreciated uh, Brother Bill's message and challenge to us. And uh, Brother Bob, you know, uh, a dear brother, another Alabamian now, and uh, traveling all over the world preaching. And Brother David, of course, at lunchtime. And man, you're in for a great treat. Brother Herb's going to preach in just a few minutes. I'm just going to warm the crowd up and get out of the way, brother. I love you, brother. Uh, he can, he, uh, I tell, tell folks, say, well, have you ever heard it? Well, he'll preach the paint off the walls. Can I get an amen in the house? And uh, I love that. I really mean that. I'm so glad. I just, I'll tell you what I'm thankful for. I'm glad I got to go first and get out of the way, man. So, but our past, our past crossed several times and it's an honor and a joy. And then your pastor, well, there, you know, I don't, words don't have, I don't have the words to explain what he means to me. You know, it's hard to be serious with a, with a bottle of a great jelly right in front of you. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm trying to be godly, be anointed. I keep looking down there and all I can think about is Cracker Barrel biscuits. That's all I can think about. You know what I, I know, I know that isn't godly and I'm just, uh, Lord, you know, get that out of my mind. But anyway, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm just thinking we ought to have apple butter right over here. Amen. So. We'd really have church, wouldn't we? So, but you know, I, I love your pastor and uh, God has uh, blessed him in such a unique way. Such a great friend to me. And uh, man, he can, he ought to be on the scale. He can preach the cover off the Bible. And I, you know, it's, in, you know, I mean, it's kind of intimidating to stand up here and you have these incredible singers that God has used literally all over the world, worship, or worship tonight. And man, to have heroes, really, you guys are heroes to me. And um, you've been such a blessing to me. I was in preschool when I first heard y'all preach, you know, and it's a, <laughs> but you're not old. Don't feel old. Don't feel old. So, uh, they are a blessing and you know, there's nothing like rubbing shoulders, iron sharpens iron. You guys, uh, I'm not where I need to be, but I'm a better pastor. I'm a better preacher. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better man because of your all's ministries. So I want to thank you for your ministry to me in Jesus' name. I receive it. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 12. Let me just run right to the message, if I may, to save a little time. Genesis chapter 12. It's an honor, and I don't say this lightly, and a privilege. And I'm humbled to stand in this pulpit and preach the word at this Bible conference. Thank you, Dr. Jerry, for inviting me back. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to speak on the subject, God is faithful. This is not really what I wanted to preach, but the Holy Spirit just continues to confirm this in my spirit. I want to speak to you about God is faithful, Genesis chapter 12. We serve a faithful God. Can I get an amen in the house? I'm reminded of this couple who was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary in Hawaii. Uh, they were celebrating beautiful marriage, faith, 50 years of faithful marriage. A local reporter heard about it, thought this would be a great interest story. And so she showed up to interview this couple and said, hey, what's been the secret to your long, happy, faithful marriage? And the husband immediately steps up and says, well, it dates all the way back to our honeymoon. We were vacationing. We were having our honeymoon at the Grand Canyon and we got on a couple of horses, you know, to kind of ride the trails down there. And we started out down those trails and uh, my new bride's wife stumbled just a bit and she leaned across the front of the horse and said, that's once. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. And we went another half mile or so down in the canyon and her ho horse stumbled again. And she leaned across the front of that horse and said, that's twice. I thought, well, what is she talking about? We went about another quarter of a mile, maybe a half mile. That horse stumbled again. In fact, her water bottle fell off the horse and she dismounted the horse, pulled out a gun right there and shot that horse dead right there in the Grand Canyon. I thought, man, what are you doing? You, you can't kill a beautiful animal. That's against the law, woman. What are you doing? She turned to me and said, now that's once. <laughs> uh -huh. 
He said, we hadn't had a problem since. (laughs) I want you to leave in a little while knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that as a born-again believer, as a Christ follower, your heavenly Father is faithful. God Almighty is faithful. Friends may leave you. Family may bail on you, but your God will never leave you or forsake you. Now let's look at a promise God made, a covenant with Abraham. It's Genesis chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, verse 1. And now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Now watch this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Now we know Abram wasn't a Baptist. He would have put together the study committee to decide whether this was the right thing to do or not. Does this make sense? Is this financially feasible? Is is this going to benefit us in some way? We got to study this, appoint a committee and bring this back next month and then we'll have to dissect it again and we'll table it till the following month. Not Abraham. God said go and Abraham got up and went. Can I get an amen in the house? I love that. And he took Lot with him. And now watch this. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Somebody say 75 years old. Incredible. Now stay with me. Think about this. God had just made an incredible promise. He told Abraham, out of you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. In other words, you're going to have this huge family. You're going to have descendants. You're going to have kids. You're going to have grandkids. You're going to have great grandkids. It's just going to be phenomenal, Abraham. This is the promise I make to you. There's only one problem. He's 75 years old and he has no kids. Is there any couples here tonight? You're 75 years of age or older. Anybody in the house like that? You're married, 75? Okay, here's a couple, here's a couple. Great, yeah. Sir, let's say on the way home. (laughs) Let me get there. You're just traveling home. Oh, wasn't the Bible conference good? Wasn't the worship incredible? Didn't the quartet knock it out of the park? Wasn't the choir and orchestra? Man, it was just one of them. And she says, honey, could we stop by the Walgreens drugstore? Why? Well, I need to get a pregnancy test. I hadn't been feeling well. I got a quiver in my liver, and I'm not sure what it is, and I thought it would pass. But for some reason, I'm just craving cold dill pickles smothered in mayonnaise and peanut butter. And I don't know why. It just came over me all of a sudden. I'm not really sure why. Now, sir, you probably would drive off the side of the road, right? This is the situation we have. God's made this amazing, incredible, phenomenal promise to Abraham that he's going to bless him with all these descendants and all these kids and grandkids and grandkids, and he has no children. Well, we pick up our story 25 years later. Flip over to Genesis 17, just a few verses. Chapter 17, watch this, verse 1. And moreover, the Bible says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am the my almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, right? And God talked with him saying, as, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abraham, and you shall be a father of many nations. We've heard that somewhere. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abram. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Verse 17, same chapter, Genesis 17:17. 17, 17. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred? years old and shall Sarah who is 90 years old bear a child Abraham's a hundred Sarah now is 90 years old it's been 25 years since God promised them a son and it still hadn't happened 
Don't you think the enemy kind of worked on him, right? He got this promise at 75, and he probably thought then, this is crazy, okay? But God, if you say it's going to happen, I've learned to believe you. I'm just going to believe this is going to happen. He's 75, no child. He's 80, no child. He's 85 years old. He's got hearing aids in both ears now, right? He, I mean, he's got a walking cane. He, you know, he, he, he's eating Geritol for breakfast, and he, he, he knows all about fiber. Can I get an amen? He's eating... He's eating so much fiber, he could have a, you know, anyway, I'll just, so I'm, I, I mean, he's 85 years old, right? Sarah's 75. He's 90. Sarah's 80. He's 95. Sarah's 85. He's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. And God shows up again on the scene and says, man, Abraham, you're not going to believe this. I'm going to bless you. I'm telling you, all the nations are going to be blessed. You're going to have descendants upon descendants. But don't, and Abraham's probably said, that's awesome, God. But where are you? It hadn't happened yet. I know I'm not supposed to tell you this, God, but Sarah's 90. She's 90 years old. Sometimes God doesn't answer when we want. Then what? I don't know who this is for tonight. I, I, it encourages me to know that God has not forgotten you and uh, God has not forsaken you. And you're wondering, where is God? You know, God gave me a word. God gave you a promise. God gave you maybe a Bible verse, something you've been holding on to. And, and you, the truth is you kind of given up hope. You, you said it didn't happen. It's been a year. It's been two years. It's been five years. It's been 10 years. It's been 20 years. And it just hadn't happened. And you're ready to give up. In fact, some of you have already given up on that promise. You've given up on that word. You've given up on that Bible verse you had circled and highlighted. I've been sent here to tell you tonight, God is still faithful. And it may not happen when you want or how you want, but God will meet your need. You say, preacher, listen, I've been praying for my husband to be saved for years and I'm ready to give up. Don't give up. I I've been praying. I need healing in my body. and It just hadn't happened. I'm still struggling. Don't give up. I've been praying. My finances are a mess. I need a job. I need a better job. Where is God? God Almighty, don't give up. My kids are running every which way but the right way. I'm saying to you tonight, don't give up. We serve a faithful God. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give in. Don't you allow the enemy to discourage you. You keep on believing. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting. You keep on believing. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting. You keep on believing. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting. Don't give up. Look at a neighbor now. Help me preach. It'll go faster if you do. If you don't, I'll keep preaching and preaching and preaching. Cracker Barrel will eventually close. Look at a neighbor and tell him, don't give up. Yeah, I've been there, haven't you? I've been there. I've been there. So here's a 100-year-old Abraham, 90-year-old Sarah, and we still have no child. You're probably tired of hearing this, but Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> I think about the four fellas who are in the waiting room, actually awaiting, anticipating the arrival of their very first child. They're all hanging out together. The nurse finally comes out and says, hey, Tim, you're not going to believe this. You have twins. And he thought, oh, that's incredible. That's amazing. I work for double mint chewing gum. She looks over to Bob and says, Bob, you're not going to believe this. You got triplets. He said, that is unbelievable. I work for the AAA Transportation Agency. She looks to Steve and says, Steve, you have quadruplets. Can you believe that? He said, you have got to be kidding me. I work for the Four Seasons Resort Hotel. Just then, Henry hit the floor. The nurse said, what's wrong with him? And they all said, he works for the 7-Eleven down the road. <laughs> yeah. I'd hit the floor too, wouldn't you, amen? Stay with me now. It's been 25 years since God made this promise, but God never breaks a promise. Flip over one page to chapter 18, verse 14. Genesis 18, 14. In fact, we may have this one on the screen. Genesis 18, 14. Watch what happens here. This is so amazing. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> oh, I love this next phrase, Brother Jerry, Brother Bob, Brother Herb, Brother Bill. This will preach itself at the appointed time. 
there's an appointed time. Sometimes it's not on my time frame. Lord, I wish you'd hurry up. Anybody always in a hurry? My grandpa's in heaven now, and he would always say to me, he would always say to me, son, you're always hurrying to wait somewhere. I thought it was in Proverbs somewhere. It sounds like a proverb, doesn't it? But it's a lot of truth, isn't it? I'm always in a hurry. I, I, it seems like, you know, dry, I don't know why. I'm, a, you know, I'm the kind of guy, you know, I'm, I'm driving. I feel like I'm late for a meeting somewhere to preach or share or something. And, and I'm riding on somebody's bumper and they're out kind of yard sale looking, just enjoying the weather. And I'm saying, come on, hurry up. If you want to walk, why'd you take your car? Come on, hurry up. And I keep, I'm on the bumper, I'm, I'm swinging out trying to find, can I get around them, can I get around them, you know, swing back, know the traffic's coming, swing out, know there's a curve in the road, got to swing back, good night, I'm running late, finally I swing out, get over in that lane, right, pass and get up there and the, it comes two lanes and I stop at the light and there's that slow poke come right up beside me. <laughs> that ever happened to you, you know what I'm saying? I'll crawl down in the, I don't, I don't wait well, I don't like traffic lights, man, I'm telling you that. Don't like elevators. You like elevators? Slow as molasses. Push those elevator buttons. Go to the hospital every now and then. Got four or five elevators. All of them up on the fifth floor. What is the deal with the fifth floor? You got four elevators. Not a one of them's down in the lobby. I go push a button and I wait and I wait and I wait. And finally, after it seems like a half an hour, one of those doors are finally open, right? Like, good night. I finally get in there and I push my floor. And you ever push that close button in the elevator? They put that in there to frustrate us type A's. It doesn't work, does it? You just keep punching that, close the button, close the button. In fact, you sometimes wonder, am I pushing the wrong one? Because you've got to get the arrows. Are they together? Are they apart? Right? Come on. You know, I don't, maybe I'm pushing. Finally, push them, push them, push them. But finally, after 30 minutes, the doors finally start to close. Eat, right? And about the time they get close, somebody in that baby will come run around the corner and stick their arm in. Wait for me! Boy, I tell you, I've been known to kick their arm out and say, honey, take the stairs. I've been waiting for this for 30 minutes. I'm going to sit around here and wait on you. I don't wait well. But I love this scripture. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'm here to tell you whatever promise you're waiting on, well, whatever word God has given you, that, that, that prayer request that you're just about to give up on, if you will just hang on at the appointed time, God Almighty, he will return to you. Wow, what a powerful scripture that is. What a powerful word that is for us tonight. Hmm. And he says, I'll return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Hmm. We've heard that before, hadn't we? Abraham said, I've heard that, Lord, for 25 years, but I'm telling you, nothing is too difficult with the Lord. He said, well, the doctor says it doesn't look good. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Well, I'm single and, and lonely. Can't seem to find that special someone. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. My kids are running every way to the right way. My, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. My finances are a mess. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. I, I, I just, I, I don't see any light in the tunnel. I've been sitting here to tell you, as a born-again believer and a Christ follower, nothing is too difficult for our God. We serve a great God. My biggest fear, Brother Jerry, is getting to heaven, thinking I've kind of lived my life outside the box, man. I really was kind of pushing the envelope for God, and God's going to, I'm going to get to heaven, and God said, you know, Kevin, you were pretty radical for me. You know, you were, you were pretty out there. My biggest fear is I'll get there to heaven, and God will say, Kevin, you only scratched the surface of what I really want to do in you and through you. I think sometimes we've forgotten how big our God is. He's a big God. He's a huge God. He's, a, he's an overwhelming God. He is a phenomenal God. He is, he is an outstanding God. He, there, is, there is no God like our God. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep on believing. Our God is faithful. Look at the neighbor. Come on, one last time and tell him God is faithful. Let me give you a couple of illustrations in one closing verse. Um, several years ago, 
Um, we, uh, at our church, we had, when we built the building, we, our steps only came so far on this side and so far on this side, and we didn't have steps in the middle and just had them on both sides. And we thought it would give us some more area and do some counseling. And after being in the building a few years, we decided we really would like to bring the steps all around. It would be more functional for weddings, dramas, other things, children's programs and all that kind of thing. So we decided what we'll do is let's just go in and we'll connect these steps and, and we'll, they'll go all the way across. You have them on that side and that side and we'll build some on the middle. And we did that. And the Sunday we were kind of kind of have a dedication just to kind of pray over those because those are just more than steps. They're what we call an altar. Now I know you can meet God anywhere in a deer stand or out in a fishing boat or some of you ladies say at the malls. I understand. I, I get that. But I'm just telling you, I believe there's something special about the altar of God in the house of God. And so we prayed over those steps. We wrote Bible verses. We anointed those steps with oil. We never know what God's going to do with those steps. He may heal bodies. He may repair marriages. He may set addicts free. He may break strongholds in people's lives. You never know what God is going to do. So we we had anointed those steps, prayed. On. It was going to be that Sunday where it was going to be the first opportunity for us to use those steps. It's going to be a great day for us. And right before the service, uh, one of the fellows came in the office where I was and said, hey, there's a lady here and she's desperate to talk to you. And I told her, he's getting ready to go out for church. I'm not sure he has time, but I told her I would ask. I said, well, sure, I'd be more than happy to talk to her. Just, just five minutes right before the service, several of the men gather and pray with me and over me and we just finished that prayer time and she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I'm sorry, I know you're getting ready to go to the service, but I got to tell you this. Um, she said, you're not going to remember this, but about a year ago, in the middle of your message, you stopped abruptly and you said, you know, I sense there's somebody here that doesn't have a job that needs a job or has a job and needs a better job. And I believe God answers prayers. You have not because you ask not. So let's just stop. If that's you, I wouldn't embarrass you for anything in the world. Would you bow your heads? If that's you, would you just stand to your feet? That's what I said. Would you just say, you need a job or a better job. Would you just stand? He said, do you remember that? And I said, yes, I, I do. Vaguely, I do. She said, well, I was one of those that stood. And I had some people gather around them and pray over them. I didn't have a job at the time. Two weeks later, she said, a construction company called me and said, hey, we've got a position we'd like to interview. And she said, well, I don't have any experience in construction. I'd be more happy to. They said, that's okay. If you're the right person, we'll train you. I said, Pastor, I, I got the job. They trained me. And they trained me to design in, in the design department. She, you know what my first responsibility, you know what my first job was? The steps. And they came in, they came, the, the order came in to the local construction company and said, hey, we're going to de design some steps for a church. And she said, oh, that, that's interesting. What church is it? And, and they told her what's Garden Hill First Baptist. She said, oh, that's my church. Now, tears are rolling down her cheek. And she said to me, Pastor, you'll never know what this is, that my first job was to design the altar steps for my own church. And I realized, God... Only God could do that. I'm not saying it always happens like that, but I am telling you, you can trust God. He's faithful. Many of you don't know me personally, but um, my first wife died of cancer. We had been married just a short time. We got married in college. We were head over heels in love, and I was going in ministry, and I'd done a little youth revival at a church in, in a rural area in Kentucky, and I met this young gal, and we were both going to the college, the local college in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We dated for a couple of years, and we got married. Uh, long story short, um, a year and a half later, she got really ill, sick, found out she had cancer. She went to the hospital. She never got out of the hospital. 89 days later, she was in the hospital 89 days. 89 days later, she died on my birthday which by the way is today. And now here, I want you to hear this story now. Obviously, you know, you've been there. Many of you have been there. We don't been married a year and a half. We didn't have children. We didn't have a long, you know, relationship. And I, but I was devastated. I was heartbroken. I just was, I just knew God was going to heal her and raise her up, you know, and God was going to give us incredible ministry. We talk about this awesome God that heals and he delivers. And my wife, well, you know, she had terminal cancer, but God said, cancer's nothing to me. And I thought we we're going to travel all over the world and brag on God and how awesome he is and how wonderful he is. I went down that little chapel they had in the hospital room, man. I got on my knees, had that little prayer altar, put on my knees. I got my Bible open. I claimed every Bible verse I could find about prayer and about God's faithfulness and God's deliverance. And man, we did, we laid hands on her. We anointed her with oil. We prayed over her. We, 
But 89 days later, God said, I'm ready for her. I'm going to take her home. He healed her. He just healed her on the other side. I didn't think I'd ever marry again. I was so heartbroken. I just said, it's not worth the risk. It's just, it's just not worth it. About a year and a half later, I was serving in my college ministry. Uh, and, uh, and so some of the students would call me because they couldn't get a hold of the senior pastor and just ask for advice or some guidance. I was kind of a college minister at that time. And so a young lady called and she was sharing me a situation. She had an overprotective, um, kind of an abusive, verbally abusive boyfriend. And she said, what do you think I ought to do? I said, well, I think you ought to drop him like a hot potato. Man, you don't want to get hooked up with this dude. This dude's a loser. This is not God's plan, God's will for you. That's my advice. And I hung up the phone and I got to thinking, boy, she's a pretty sharp gal. So I called my pastor and I said, Pastor, I said, Brother Richard, do you know Kim Hood? And he said, yes. I said, man, she seemed like a sharp young lady. I said, what would you think? It's a year and a half later now. What, what would you think about me asking her out on a date? And he said, well, man, she'd be awesome. She loves the Lord. She, she's a godly young lady. I think that'd be wonderful. I said, but she has a boyfriend. I said, no, she doesn't. <laughs> Sometimes God will give you a right word at the right time, amen? <laughs> and so, Kim and I dated and eventually married. We'll celebrate 33 years this June. We have three beautiful daughters. God is faithful. Yeah, yeah. Could I give you one more and then I'm out of the way? Um, Kim and I... Uh, I went to Memphis, Tennessee to go to seminary at Mid-America, Baptist Theological Seminary in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, when I went there, Kim and I just got married and uh, we had moved to the city. We didn't know anyone at the city. We didn't have a job. We didn't know one person literally in the city, but we just felt like this is where God was calling us to go. And so in 1987, we moved to Memphis to go to Mid-America Seminary. We didn't have any money, didn't have any jobs. The seminary tried to help kind of find us some jobs. And my wife found a job at State Farm Insurance. I got a job as a work shipper with Bellevue Baptist Church when it was downtown, Dr. Adrian Rogers, at uh, the Pollard Activities Building. And I would work, I would go to school during the day from 8 to noon. I would have lunch. I had two or three hours to study. And then I would go over to the Pollard Activities Building. I worked from 3 to 11 and I would close the building out. And I did that for about a year. And for some reason, God kind of disturbed our heart about a small little church that we saw in the area where we were living at that time in the raleigh Fraser area of Memphis, Tennessee. And so we visited that little church a few times and we just felt kind of like maybe this is where God wants us to be. And so um, we decided that's what we would do. And I went in and just made mention of this to my boss. And, and he said to me, well, you realize you'll lose your job. And I said, no, I, I didn't realize that. And he said, yes, uh, this job's tied to church membership. And I understood that. That made sense. And he said, so, you know, just think about that. And I did. Kim and I talked about it. We didn't have two nickels to rub together, but we really felt like God was calling us to this church to help. We wrestled with it. We were living paycheck to paycheck. Some of you have been there. Some of you may be there now. I get it. I understand. And I'm telling you, at night, we kept rolling around wrestling. God, surely you don't want us to do this. God, I can't walk away from this job. I'm a seminary student. We're just barely making it, God. And the Holy Spirit just wouldn't. Sometimes the Holy Spirit won't leave you alone. Come on. Anybody been in the house like that? Just doesn't work to argue with God. You lose, right? So I walked in and told my boss, I said, hey, uh, we finally made a decision. We really feel like this is where God has called us. We love Bellevue. We've been there for almost two years, but we really feel like God's called us to plug in, help this little small church in this community. And he said, well, that's fine. He said, just keep working until we find somebody, and then you can train them. And I said, okay, well, that's what I'll pray. I'll pray, God, don't let them find anybody. I just figured... I figured that's how God was going to answer my prayer, right? And so we just said, Lord, don't let him find him. Don't let him. And two weeks went by, and all of a sudden, uh, the Rick Taylor worked there at the time, walked in and said, hey, we found somebody. It's on a Wednesday. Could you train him Thursday and Friday? And Friday will be your last day. And I said, okay. And I went home that Wednesday. Man, we were so discouraged. We don't know what we're going to do. I didn't have a job, no, no lead on a job, and had two days left. I trained this guy Thursday and Friday. Went home Friday, and man, we were so discouraged. God, I thought you told us this is what you wanted. Now what are we going to do now? Monday's coming. The rent's due. Kim's got a little entry-level job with State Farm Insurance answering the telephones. I don't have a job. What are we going to do? How are we going to survive, God? Where are you? 
we'd been going to that little church a little bit, and so we went on that Sunday, and we sat uh, kind of in the back on, on one end of the aisle, and the pastor came walking in, and he leaned over to me when he walked in, and he said, hey, what are you, what are you guys, what are you and Kim doing for lunch today? And we said, nothing. We go to seminary. He said, well, my wife and I want to take you out to eat. We're going to go to old Charlie's. I said, that'd be great. I said, honey, grab every roll you got and shove it in your purses. I'm going to... I'm going to put them in my pockets, and then I'm going to put them in my socks. And, man, we're just going, we're going to load up on old Charlie Rose, manna from heaven. Can I get an amen, you know? We're sitting there in that old Charlie's in Memphis, Tennessee, and this pastor says to me, hey, uh, some of the teenagers have been saying you've been playing basketball with them afterwards. I said, yeah, I'm from Kentucky. That's what we do, and I love ball, and I've been kind of hanging out with them. And they said, well, they've really enjoyed being with you and your wife. And you may not know this, but we have a Christian school and our basketball coach just left. And I was wondering if you might consider coaching the basketball team. And he was also our student pastor in our church. And you could also serve as our student pastor. And you could coach and be a student pastor here at the church. Is that something you would consider? And before I could even take a breath, he said, now I know you've got a job right now. I, I've already researched. I know you're at Bellevue. And he just said in passing, I, I don't know what they're paying you, but whatever they're paying you, we will match. I said, well, they're paying me $175,000. Hey, he's a big God, amen? I just thought, well, Lord, while I'm at it. I did. I said something like he laughed and I laughed. And I, and I said to him, I said, you're not going to believe this, Pastor. I said, Friday was my last day. Tears are rolling down my eyes, rolling down Kim's eyes. He said, you start Monday. I said, I'll be there. I'm going to tell you before I read this last scripture. We went home that afternoon. We lived on the second floor, Sawmill Drive. I could take you to the little apartments in Raleigh, Frazier. Right now, I could take you to the apartments. They didn't have housing at that time, and uh, campus housing. We lived in an apartment. And we went up on that Sunday afternoon, that little second floor apartment. We had a dog then, a whippet. It's a, like a small greyhound. That's have children just had a whippet. That was our child at that time. You knew it got pets. You know what I'm talking about. And, um, we closed that door that Sunday afternoon, and I just want—I don't want to frighten any of you, but I'm going to tell you, we cleared us off a spot that afternoon, and we scared the living daylights out of our whippet. We had us a little Baptocostal party. As we began to celebrate and sing and dance and shout. And it's as if God was saying to me, and I, I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but it's as if Pastor, Brother Jerry, it, Brother Bob, Brother Herb, Brother Bill, it's as if God was saying to me, Kevin, for, for years now, decades, you're going to preach about my faithfulness. You're going to talk to people whose lives are falling apart, and you're going to tell them there's no God like our God. You're going to tell them about my deliverance. You're going to talk about my provision. You're going to say, hey, God can heal, and God can restore, and God can rebuild. You're going to talk about how awesome I am and how wonderful I am, but you can't talk about something that you have not experienced firsthand. So, God, I'm going to do something in your life right here, right now, and you're going to look back on this 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you're going to say, our God is faithful, our God is mighty, our God is big, and God can handle anything that comes your way. He's a big God. Our God is faithful. Now listen, it doesn't always happen that way. I get it. It hasn't always happened that way for me, but don't you let the enemy rob you of your victory. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't you throw in the towel. You just stand still and you watch God work in your life. Genesis 21, and I'm through. Let me read these verses. Genesis 1, watch this. Here's how the story closes. And the Lord visited Sarah, oh, <laughs> as he said. Hmm. Just hang on. He'll show up. Just as he said. God always keeps his promises. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Both wouldn't scare you. I might run a lap. Well, I'd have done that 10 years ago, not now, but anyway. <laughs> for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. 
Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. He's a faithful God. Would you bow your heads just for a moment? What promise, hear me now, don't miss this, what word has God given to you that you've just about given up on? God is faithful. Don't quit. Don't stop. Keep on believing. Keep on praying. Keep on trusting. God, I want to thank you tonight that when I'm not faithful, you are faithful. Hmm. Hear me, church. If God kept his promise to 90-year-old Sarah and 100-year-old Abraham, he'll keep his promise to you. God is faithful. And we praise your holy, matchless, and wonderful name. The name that is above every name. The name which demons tremble. The name that sets the prisoners free. The name that delivers the captives. The name that breaks strongholds. The name that raises the dead. We pray it in that name. The holy name. The name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you give Him praise tonight? Amen. Come on.